The Titans have set their practice squad. They also made a few surprising additions. Kendall Vildor, Travis Gibson, and Cade York. What does it all mean? We're going to break it down. This is the Music City Audible. Let's get to it. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Music City Audible podcast. And yes, the Titans have made some additions and they have finalized their practice squad for now. Of course, these things are never final. This is going to be churning throughout the season. I wouldn't be surprised to see some churn heading into next week's uh, week one matchup with the New Orleans Saints. But we're going to break down what we know today. Justin, how's it going? Doing well, man. Excited to talk about all these moves. They've been very, very busy since uh, quote unquote finalizing their 53 man roster. That's right. We taped a few pods. Uh, we've taped a pod and a few videos here. Like, and some of the stuff we said in the video that came out this morning is already uh, out of date. Taping this now on Thursday. So let's go through the practice squad here. There are 16 guys right now as we tape this. We're expecting there to be 17 by tomorrow once Justin Murray clears waivers, but that has not happened yet. So as of this taping, there are 16. We do expect 17. Those guys are wide receiver Trayshawn Harrison, wide receiver Mason Kinsey. Tight end Thomas Odakoya, who will count as an exemption because of the International Player Pathway Program, so he will not count towards the 16. That's why the Titans are able to have 17 guys. Tight end Kevin Rader, offensive tackle John Ajukwu, offensive tackle Andrew Rupsich, guard Jordan Roos, defensive tackle Michael Dwumfor, defensive tackle Kyle Pico, defensive end TK McClendon, linebacker Chance Campbell, linebacker Thomas Rush, Defensive back Shaheem Carter, defensive back Eric Garor, and defensive back Amani Marsh. And rounding out the group is kicker Cade York. We expect Justin Murray will be added to this once he clears waivers, but that has not happened yet. Um, what do you make of this group, Justin? Who's the biggest surprise to you that didn't get added to the practice squad? Well, I, I think two of the guys that stuck out to me that didn't make it were uh, Stephen Jones Jr., the corner out of App State. He was a first-year UDFA. I thought he played quite well in the preseason when given opportunities. A press man corner. Had a lot of great numbers at App State. Again, played well, I think, when the Titans put him into the game. I expected him to get added. He didn't. Don't be surprised if they revisit those talks at some point. That's what I've been told. So some exclusive info Mm. here um, for this video. And and secondly, uh, uh, of course, kicker Cade York, right? I have to list as a surprise because he's the lone outside addition to this practice squad so far, right? Everyone else was on the Titans 90 man roster throughout the summer. So Cade York is certainly the most surprising addition and probably the best one in all honesty, right? Because honestly, here's a guy that was a legendary kicker in the sec has been a big time kicker prospect for what, like six years now, like they coming out of high school, he was well known uh, for how great he was. Obviously got a case of the yips last year with the Browns only made 75% of his field goals in his rookie year. Just needs some rebuilding, I think, behind the scenes. Needed a change of scenery, probably. Needs to get his confidence back. Um, This is excellent for the Titans. I I, I joked on the last pod, the Titans have cycled through 105 kickers over the last three years. Well, Rand Carthon, uh, even though he's new to this, is tired of seeing that. Mike Vrabel is certainly tired of it because he's lived through it all. Uh, He's coached them through it all. So getting Nick (laughs) Folk onto the roster, a 38-year-old Band-Aid, and then getting getting Cade York onto the practice squad offers a potential long-term solution. Uh, Really, really strong move for the Titans. Gives them a strong uh, backup plan B. I love that addition. There are a few others I want to talk about, but I'm going to turn it back to you first. Yeah, Cade York uh, is a guy that just needs to get the mental side right because he has all the physical talent in the world. He made a 58-yard field goal last year. I can't tell you the last time the Titans even attempted a 58-yard field goal. Have they ever? Have they ever in their history? Um, (laughs) Maybe they have. I don't know. I don't remember it, but... Uh, so Rand Carthon talked a lot about how the, they have a staff behind the scenes that, you know, will get them right from the neck up. They said, he said, we have everyone better to get them right from the neck down and everyone to get them better from the neck up. So they'll attack that from two different fronts. So they obviously have like team sports psychologists that are going to work with Cade York there and try to get him back on track. But I do love the move for a future. Like, can you solidify the kicker position for the next 10 to 15 years? that's a a potential avenue to doing so that they didn't have before adding York to the roster. I will throw out a big surprise to me, and that is that Sam Okwanu, who you and I both had on our initial 53-man roster projection video a week ago, he didn't even make the practice squad. Now, he made the initial practice squad, but through the churns that have happened in the last couple days, he has been released from the practice squad, and we presume that's, again, to make room for Justin Murray, who was cut from the 53-man roster, but... 
Man, that one is surprising to me because he's a guy who flashed a lot last year, friend of the pod, so obviously we're rooting for him for personal reasons because he's just a, a nice guy and a great guy that we want to see succeed. So uh, I'll definitely throw that out as my biggest surprise. Yeah, it's certainly a surprise. I, I'm not going to spend a, a too much time on it because I wouldn't be surprised if he rejoins them at some point. I, I think this is a daily thing in the NFL, as you mentioned, and I, I don't get the feeling that we've seen the last of Samo in Tennessee. Now, maybe he gets an opportunity elsewhere and decides to join another practice squad. I don't know, but I have a feeling he'll be back in Nashville. I'll throw out one other quick surprise before I want to get to some of the other moves. Uh, they don't have a running back on the practice squad, and I right. thought they would add Jacques Patrick to this team um, based on how well he played in that final preseason game against the Patriots. You know, average 5.1 yards per carry, really ran hard, tough, hard-nosed runner. I think had a team high like 76 or 77 yards in that game, something along those lines. I thought he would get added. He didn't. They don't have a running back at all, as I alluded to. And that really just signals how much confidence they have in the three that they have on their roster, right? Derrick Henry, Tajay Spears, and, and, and Julius Chestnut. And they should have confidence in those three. It's, it's a really good three. Uh, if you watched our last YouTube video, I ranked them as the best overall position on the Titans. I think that the team, the GM, is probably in agreement with me. It's pretty rare that you got a practice squad and don't put a running back on it. Well, that's what yeah. you can do when you've got so much confidence in the three guys you have on your 53. Yeah, and you just hope they stay healthy. And if, you know, God forbid an injury happens and you need to add a running back, like if there's one position that the NFL is flush with on the free agent market, yeah. I think the running back position is it. Um, just a few more notes here on the practice squad before we move on to the other additions. I, I just want to point out some developmental high upside guys that are here. John Ajukwu is someone that we were really high on early in training camp, suffered an injury, and uh, you know he was the guy that Mike Vrabel threw out as a competitor for the starting right tackle job in the absence of Nicholas petit Friere. but he ended up getting hurt, I think, even before the first preseason game, yeah. and so he didn't really have a chance to compete for that job. But I do think the staff is still high on what he could be develop into so that's a guy to keep an eye on 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 the practice squad throughout the season thomas odakoya we mentioned he has a an exemption so that allows the titans to keep 17 guys on this practice squad instead of 16 the thing is if they want to call him up for a game there's like a three-week processing time where he can be added to the practice squad as an as an ordinary player that's not an exemption you lose the exemption then for the rest of the season if you decide to go that route and uh, a, he could only be called up three times from the practice squad in games without just being added to the 53 man roster so that's an interesting one but another developmental guy that i think could play a big role on the titans maybe not this year but starting in 2024 and beyond and then of course can't leave out eric garor who we were surprised didn't make the final 53-man roster, but nice to see him here on the practice squad. Again, a guy I think the staff likes and will want to develop uh, as a young player that if they if they suffer an injury somewhere or whatever, they could call up or just to have as a stash and develop type of guy. Yeah, I'm going to second everything you said there because, you know, Eric and, and, uh, and Thomas were a few guys we had on our 53-man roster, so it's great that they're able to keep them on the practice squad. Another two that I thought were good gets were, were Michael Dwumfor and Kyle Pico. I, I thought, you know, they were probably going to make the 53, in my opinion. The team ended up going a little lighter um, on the D-line than I thought they would. Right? I, thought, I thought they'd keep six. I think they only kept four, maybe five. Uh, I guess, again, if you count the, the Dina Coatri battle that we've talked about. Uh, but I, I thought they would keep at least one more. They didn't. And they get both of them for and Pico back to the practice squad. So I thought that was really, uh, really good uh, for them. Yeah, I agree. And then the rest of the guys we're kind of familiar with, they've been here at least one year, if not two, aside from Treshawn Harrison, the rookie receiver they add, or an uh, UDFA they add to the practice squad. Chance Campbell to get back on the practice squad after waving him, former draft pick of the team. So, um, and Armani Mar Marsh, another rookie that they were able to add. So, uh, overall, pretty good group. I think it's a pretty strong practice squad group. Not that that really matters too much, but it's nice to see that the Titans do have some young talent that they're working to develop back there. Let's talk about the additions here. Two guys that are that are pretty big, Kendall Vildor and Travis Gibson, both come over from the Bears. Before we talk about them, let me remind everyone watching to please subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you're not watching, if you're only listening, go to YouTube and watch this video. Drop a comment below. Who who are you most looking forward to seeing uh, out of these practice squad guys whenever they get the call up or if it's one of the new additions? For me, it's Travis Gibson because in 2021, when the Bears were playing a 3-4 defense, 
this guy was an absolute wrecking ball. He piled up seven sacks, five forced fumbles on the year. It was really eight sacks, but two of them were half sacks. So it's a total of seven sacks, but eight plays that led to seven sacks. And I know that because I put the highlight reel together that's on the YouTube channel. You can go check that out. But this is, a, I mean, a player that's going to be what your third or fourth I guess fourth, probably defensive end rotating in, maybe maybe third, uh, depending on again what Danico Autry counts as. But look, the best defenses, those Super Bowl winning defenses, like with the Eagles. I mean, the Eagles weren't a Super Bowl winner, but the, the Eagles had what uh, NFL high sack number last year, seventy seventy sacks. Like the teams that do those kinds of that can put that kind of production on the field have multiple guys on the defensive line and at the edge position that they can rotate throughout a game to keep guys fresh, to keep the tackles guessing with different pass rush moves and different rushers that they're going to have to face. And the Titans have a lot of versatility here too, adding Gibson. This is going to be a fierce group and it could be one of the best pass rushing groups in the league. Adding Gibson at this point in the season to be the depth kind of piece that he's going to be is such a luxury. And there was a lot of uh, people on Twitter and, and I guess everywhere wondering if this has something to do with Arden Key who's been out of practice for a few days with an injury I don't think so I think if they were worried about Arden Key's status he probably would have been placed on IR you know missed the first four games of the season maybe they think he's only going to miss one or two at this point until we hear anything further I'm assuming that Arden Key's going to be fine for week one and is just getting his body right for that so to me Gibson is not a signal that there's anything wrong with Arden Key it's just Rand Carthon Mike Vrabel seeing a guy who was super productive in the 2021 season. Bears switched to a 4-3 defense last year. He was kind of the odd man out. He was the fifth most double-teamed player in football, though, last year in terms of edge rushers, which is wild to think about that Travis Gibson was the fifth most double-teamed player. It's like, usually you expect the household names, the Nick Bosa's, the TJ Watts to be the most double-teamed. So he had a fall-off year last year. But a guy who's still super talented, who's a great scheme fit, who had two sacks against the Titans in the preseason game that the Titans and Bears played against each other. Identifying that talent on the market and able to add him to this defense, I think, is a huge win. I think this is an outstanding addition. I, I, I second everything you said. And I'll add it, the fifth most double team. I wonder if that was a result of he's the only talented guy the Bears had last year. The numbers may not reflect it, but the Bears were terrible. Sorry, I mean, the numbers may not reflect how talented he was last year based on he only had three sacks. But what I'm saying is the Bears were terrible rushing the passer last year. So I'm not surprised opposing offenses looked at the tape and said, well, Gibson's the only one they got. And a lot of that's based on the respect he would have earned from 2021 tape, right? Based on the fact that he had right. those seven sacks. So I'm not shocked opposing OCs approached the Bears last year and said, well, he's the one we got a double team. They've got no one else that can get after the quarterback. They, they were atrocious. I think their leading sack uh, guy was a safety last year. It was Eddie Jackson who had four sacks. That's how bad they were <laughs> last season. Seriously. That's why they went out. This guy got to Marcus Walker, Yannick Ngakwe, drafted two D tackles, yada, yada. But outstanding addition at this point in the year. As you said, a perfect scheme fit. He's coming back to play in a 3-4. Uh, you know, Titans are multiple, but, you know, at times, you know, Tier Tart is a nose tackle. They do run a lot of 3-4 looks. Of course, they at times will switch that up. They've got so many different packages. But uh, coming down, he'll be able to play in a 3-4 when Tart's at the nose. He, this was key to him. He wanted to be in a 3-4 defense. Again, it's part of the reason why uh, he picked the Titans over other authors that uh, – authors over other offers that he had. And um, this group is going to be so good. I mean, between him, Jeffrey Simmons, Dina Coatry, Harold Landry, Arden Key, Rashad Weaver. I mean, it's crazy how much disrespect this group gets by the national media. This is going to be one of the best pass rushing groups in the NFL if they all stay healthy, or even if most of them stay healthy, right? It should be outstanding. And I agree with what you said about the key thing. By no means, and I was surprised to see that on Twitter, by no means did my mind go to, oh, this is a, an Arden key injury concern. No, I think this is a, we've got a terrific opportunity to acquire a player that would normally not be available at this time of year. Right. So we're going to go ahead and pull the trigger on that opportunity because you don't pass up opportunities like this to strengthen your 53 man roster. So I'm not worried about key at all. This is such a, such a uh, I'm so excited about this addition. I can't say it enough. I've been on Twitter. I think I've fired off three or four tweets already. Um, this defense is going to be so, so good. They're going to get after the quarterback. Absolutely, they will. And the other addition here is Kendall Vildor, who I didn't know much about. He's started a few games in this league. Apparently, he has inside-outside versatility. Yeah, go ahead, Justin. Take this one. You know what? I'm going to take it because I remember him coming out of Georgia, uh, Georgia Southern 
uh, in the draft class a couple of years ago. I can't remember who it was, but um, I, I might I might have interviewed him. It's hard. I, I damn it, I interviewed too many guys, right? So I, I think I might have interviewed him coming out in 2020. I don't remember, but I remember having conversations. Um, with his agent or whoever it was throughout the 2020 pre-draft process about him. And I remember predicting that he was going to get drafted. And then he did in the fifth round as a small schooler out of Georgia Southern had really, had really, really good tape coming from a small program. And look, he's lasted right here. We are 2023 about he's entering his fourth season now and, and he's still in the NFL. So that says a lot about him coming out of a small school as a day three guy. But When the Titans finalized this 53-man roster, I don't know if I said it to you or not. I said it on radio. Can't remember everything I say everywhere I go, but if there was going to be a position that I thought they would might make a claim at, corner kind of stuck out to me, right? Because I talked about how good, you know, how much I like the top three in in, in, uh, Roger McCreary, Sean Murphy, Bunting, and and, and Christian Fulton. But look, it's not pessimistic. It's the truth. The chances of all three of those guys staying healthy for the course of a 17-game season, you're relying on those three corners to play all 17 games, and one of them is pretty injury-prone, as we know. Like, good luck. Yeah. you got to rely on your backups. And they didn't have much there, right? They got a second-year UDFA, Trey Avery, who played some good football for them last year in spurts, but relatively unexperienced, took his bumps and bruises, right? And then they got a, a UDFA from a D3 school, Anthony Kendall, right? Out of Baldwin-Wallace. Right. That was kind of a surprise on the 53 man roster, not a surprise to you though, because you had them on yours. So, uh, <laughs> but it was a surprise to most people. If one of those guys get, go down. I mean, Avery Kendall, uh, you're really going to be a little bit nervous about that. So bringing in Kendall Vildor, he's more experienced than both of them. He's played good football throughout his time with, I thought he was especially good in 2021. I think it was, he's got, again, he's got more experience than both of them, more of a decorated resume. So he's going to come in and honestly, he might be there in corner four immediately, right? Yeah. He'll certainly battle Trey Avery for that for that number four spot. So I thought that was a spot they certainly needed better depth at on defense. And I think Vildor is uh, a, a pretty shrewd addition uh, to this roster. I, I imagine he's going to have to play at some point, and I would feel more confident throwing him out there as opposed to the other guys. Yeah, and um, really quick before we end this episode, a couple more points I want to say here. The Titans put in a waiver claim for wide receiver Elijah Higgins. I don't know who Elijah Higgins is. The Titans did not succeed in this waiver claim because the Cardinals were able to get him. And they also put in a claim on guard Nick Broker, who ended up was claimed by the Texans, but the Titans put in a waiver claim there. So it looks like they are not necessarily thrilled maybe with the depth at wide receiver and guard because they tried to make moves there. So I don't know if that means they're going to do anything else over the next few days, but something to keep an eye on. If somebody becomes available, they may go after a wide receiver or a guard here. Uh, Anything to make out of those potential moves that didn't happen? Yeah. What did I just say about interviewing too many guys? Both of them are rookies. I interviewed both Elijah Higgins and Nick Broker just a couple of months ago. Higgins is an intriguing one because a lot of teams, he was pretty good at receiver at Stanford, but a lot of teams are thinking about converting him to tight end. So he might actually be a tight end. And I bet the Titans viewed him as one. He made a lot of plays for the Miami Dolphins throughout the summer. I know the Dolphins Mm. were bummed about losing him. They were hoping to sneak him onto the practice squad. Well, they didn't even come close to doing that because five teams put in a claim for him. Very intriguing developmental guy. And the Titans need better depth at tight end. So I bet they were thinking about him as a tight end. And, and they saw him at the senior bowl. Nick Broker, I felt very validated about this failed waiver claim. And that's a weird thing to say, but all throughout the pre-draft process, and I posted it on Twitter this morning, go months back, go read my final big board on broadwaysportsmedia.com. I did a top 300. I was higher on Nick Broker than most. I really liked his tape coming out of Ole Miss. I had him 92 overall. I knew I had him way higher than where he'd get drafted. I don't remember where he got drafted. You could look it up, but I think it was in the 150s. I knew I was significantly higher on him than where he'd go. But what did I write on broadwaysportsmedia.com? Three, top 300 big board. I only picked out select prospects to write a blurb about because I wasn't going to write a blurb about all 300. Well, I picked out Nick Broker, and you know what I said? I said he's an outstanding fit for the Titans' outside zone blocking scheme. And they didn't end up drafting him. It is what it is, but they must have felt similarly because they put in a claim for a guy that was a super late-round draft pick. Right, Very interesting to me. Very interesting. I really liked him coming out of Ole Miss. I loved the fit between him and the Titans. Didn't end up working out, but he's clearly someone that they had a, a draftable grade on, I would think, 
uh, because they tried to get him. So I'm making a lot about both of those waiver claims, uh, failed waiver claims at least, and I'm metaphorically patting myself on the back for the Nick Broker one. Well, well, kudos to you, and I'll pat you on the back for one more thing here as we close out this show. Dylan Radins is back on the field. We knew that he was activated off the PUP list, but he is back and participating in team drills during practice. This guy looks way ahead of schedule where you typically see someone from a December ACL tear already back on the practice field. It's not even September until tomorrow. So good for him. Good for the Titans. Add another depth piece to the offensive line. And with the waving of Justin Murray, who again said for the fourth time, expect to probably get him back on the practice squad, but there's no guarantees there. Um, and even if they do that, Dylan Radins is on the active roster. I think Dylan Radins jumped like three or four guys in terms of tackle depth just by coming off the PUP, something no, none of us really expected because we don't really know what to make of Radins right now. Apparently he's working at tackle was working at right tackle in Thursday's practice. Um, Mike Vrabel did say that they're going to work him at guard and tackle. So I still have a chance to be right about this one. But <laughs> as of now, this is another pat on the back for you because it looks like Dylan Radins. I mean, if Justin Murray's not on the active roster and you head into week one, Chris Hubbard as your starting right tackle, Andre Dillard as your starting left tackle, your backup tackles are Jalen Duncan and Dylan Radins. And that's it. If somebody gets hurt, Jalen Duncan's not coming into the game in week one of his rookie year after being a sixth round developmental project pick who had a pretty rough preseason. Dylan Radins is going to be the guy, the first guy off the bench at tackle that's shocking to me. This is a shocking development. So kudos it's, to you for, for for now winning that one, and we'll see how this continues to evolve. It's a very positive development, in all honesty. It is. Uh, very positive development for the Titans. Um, because Dylan Radins, I mean, it insinuates he recovered from this in like six months. That's, un- that's yeah. an unbelievable recovery time, right? It's by far the best case scenario. And only the top few percenters are able to recover in six. It's it's exceptional. It's very good news for him. It's good news for the team. And I venture they see him quickly entering that competition at right tackle uh, because they waved Justin Murray, who I thought we both thought were in contention to start at right tackle, right? So it's like incredible, incredible news. I, I mean, the upside, how, wouldn't it be unbelievable if like three years into career, Dylan Radins was finally the answer at right tackle that we hoped he'd be <laughs> in 2021, I believe it was? Like, yeah. crazy. It, that would be such a positive development for this franchise. Of course, it would have ended up wasting the first two years of his rookie deal, which is a shame, but uh, it is what it is. I, I expect he's going to get into the mix at some point, and that's a very intriguing storyline to follow. There's definitely a chance that Radins is the right tackle starting games some point this season Absolutely. perhaps before npf suspension is up and he you know takes over for chris hubbard at that spot perhaps even after npf suspension is up if dylan radins ends up being a better player they're going to play the best guy there so all good things for the titans there with the offensive line being the question mark that it is uh you can never have too much depth i don't know if this is quality depth that remains to be seen but you hope that it is um, anything else we should hit on Justin before we say, before we sign off here. And I mean, next podcast we record is going to be game week, baby. That's exciting. That's extremely exciting. No, I think we've covered it. We expected Kyle Phillips to go on IR. I don't know if that's one yeah. we can quickly touch on, but, uh, confirm that's why they, you know, that's why they kept seven receivers, uh, on the initial 53. They figured Murray would be going, uh, sorry, Phillips would be going on IR. They still got six. He'll miss at least four games back in time for week five. It's a bummer, but Imagine Chris Moore will play in the slot until then. Uh, and and uh, Kiaris uh, Jackson will probably return punts as well. So, uh, no, I think that essentially covers everything. Yeah, the Corey Levin stuff was weird. He was waived. He was re-signed. Like, we don't know what's going on there. He wasn't even technically back on the team yet, but he was at practice on Thursday. So, like, he's obviously going to be re-signed. Uh, some, some weird stuff going on with the roster there. But everything that we touched on, I think, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and this morning uh, still holds now as we head into Thursday afternoon. So... I will get this edited as quick as possible so we can get it to the people. And um, that's it for this episode. Thanks for watching. Thanks for tuning in. Again, leave a comment below. Subscribe to the channel. Give us a thumbs up. Turn on the notification bell so that you get alerts every time we post a new video on the YouTube channel. And again, if you're just listening to this on audio, like we really need you to go to the YouTube because we're trying to grow. We're trying to improve the, uh, the reach of our channel here. And we need your help to do so. So please... Head over to the YouTube, youtube.com slash at Music City Audible Podcast. That'll do it for this one. Follow Justin on Twitter at Justin M underscore NFL. Follow me at Titans Film Room. Until next time, 
Y'all stay safe out there and tighten up. A Broadway Sports Media Production.